Hey everyone, I'm really excited to share what's been incubating with Open Firehawk for the last few years since SIGGRAPH. So right now I'm going to give you a little bit of a demo on what, what can be automated in the back end of Firehawk in order to give people a good foundation for running any type of VFX workload that they might want to in the cloud. So the main thing that Firehawk solves is giving people a foundation to build their own images. Um, and those that's also an environment that they might use to build images for their own um, network on site as well. Uh, providing users a VPN so that they can essentially unify their on-site network and the cloud network so that all those resources uh, don't really have any wall between them. Uh, so that really enables technologies like side, side effects PDG, which really does need a VPN in order for it to operate currently. And then we also provide uh, a foundation for people to have um, good security practices. Uh, so for example, we use HashiCorp Vault, which automates SSH certificates. So we have a good level of protection against man in the middle attacks. Um, and we're using encrypted technologies wherever possible. Um, the other thing that we're doing with Vault is we're getting machines to use the roles that we assign to them in order to automate some, some parameters. So that might be automating uh, anything from getting an SSH certificate to um, say the VPN generating a dynamic password and storing it in Vault. And so that means that users don't actually have to use um, a VPN uh, web interface. They don't even need to have access to the web interface in order for us to automate that process. So Vault provides um, an, another sort of, I guess, further hardening against potential access points. It allows us to more easily tuck things away and um, prevent public access to things like the web interface of OpenVPN. So I'm gonna get started with a, a quick demo. I'm not gonna show the full initialization process, but I'm just gonna give you um, the, like a, just an overview of what parameters we're using and how it automates and what it automates. So we start with this CloudFormation template, and this is really just a UI to drive some of the parameters that are important for any deployment. So we used to have a hundred, a hundred parameters um, when I first presented this work at SIGGRAPH and because we're using Cloud9 to implicitly acquire a lot of the configuration, we're able to reduce that um, down to just this number right now. So when a user spins this up, they're really just setting parameters um, which are stored in an SSM parameter store in, in AWS and we pull those parameters based on the environment. So we set our environment, we have our organization name. Um, that's used to generate certificates and we set a TTL on our root certificates. So at the moment, those certificates are gonna last about a year. Uh, currently, though, currently the certificates are used primarily for console DNS. There are other certificates involved that go beyond this, but these will eventually expire. So the images have an implicit ability to communicate with hosts when they're used um, in order to find each other. Uh, but after one year, the images we build wouldn't be functional. So we also define the network range that all our remote nodes are gonna spin up within. We define our public IP address. So that's the IP address of my site location right now. And we also define the network range for our current network location. And this is all just required because I want to, I want to actually provide a, a means to unify two networks. So if users didn't need this sort of stuff, it could be simplified further, but um, I'm really interested in being able to run one or two machines at home combined with um, cloud systems. So that network range is, is required for routing. This range, you don't need to worry about too much. It's just good to know that it's there because you don't want a conflict, but for the most part, this is just what OpenVPN uses uh, internally for its, its communication protocol. You don't need to worry about that though. And then we've got um, our 
global bucket extension. So we automate the creation of a bunch of S3 cloud storage buckets and we use a global extension in order to provide a meaningful namespace for the for the ends or, or I guess you'd say the suffixes of all of those buckets. Um, and then lastly, if you did have a Houdini server on site, you could put that in here so that um, hosts will know where to acquire uh, their licenses from. It's not, it's not necessary though, because you should be able to configure deadline to provide licenses too. And lastly, on the SiteFX website, if you want to automate the download of Houdini software and you want to get the latest daily build when you're building your images, these are provided by the SiteFX website so that you can automatically download Houdini. And that's used automatically when we build our images. So, um, the first thing we're going to do is, oh, I suppose I didn't, I didn't explain something. So when we launch an environment in cloud nine, we also assign a tag and that tag allows the instance to know what environment it's operating in. And it acquires all the parameters that you would have set here. And then there is one other thing that we do in cloud nine. We, we assign a custom profile to give the instance all of the permissions it requires uh, in order to operate and, and provision all our resources. So in cloud nine, this is really our seed instance and it's responsible for creating all of our resources. It's essentially our root of trust as well. Uh, so we will also create uh, vault instances uh, but since everything's being created from this instance in the first place, this is, this is really our root of trust here. Um, and once it's, once it's done its work, Vault can take over as our root of trust. It's possible for this instance to be destroyed and for us to um, pick up where we left off elsewhere. So anyway, uh, the first thing we're going to do is going to source some variables. And we're just picking up a bunch of implicit variables required to provision. If this is the first time you're using it, you wouldn't have any images. So we need, we would need to build those. So the first thing we would do is build our base AMIs. And these are really just dealing with software updates. So the purpose of a base AMI is to get the software updates out of the way so that you're not running them when you do future builds all the time. Obviously it's good to update um, your operating systems as much as possible, but the purpose of this is to give you a, a, I guess a stable foundation because software updates can break things if you just run them all the time. And it would affect the reproducibility of any image layers that would come on top of this. So the purpose of this is to get rid of that, um, I guess, instability that can be introduced by software updates. We're building a bunch of images all in parallel here for all the operating systems um, and use cases that we might have. So we've got, you know, the, the main ones really are our VPN. We've got Ubuntu instances uh, for, a, many of our servers, and we do run a CentOS instance for rendering presently. Uh, although I am looking at phasing that out since CentOS's end of life. And so once those base images are done, I'm gonna race ahead because they they are already done, they exist, and I can just pick up the latest. So we're gonna just pretend that, that they're all finished. And then we would continue and build our final images from there. So when all the images get built, they, they look at the commit tag uh, and so the commit hash uh, for the repository that or the sub module that they live in. So we have a way of knowing what code produced these images. And so we then will build our final images that would be 
using the base images as inputs. And so here there's, there's a lot going on. We've got, uh, say when we build our deadline database image, we're automatically downloading the deadline installer um, from an S3 bucket that AWS provide. And we're also automatically downloading Houdini for our render node. If you don't want to configure automatic downloads or if you had other software that couldn't, you couldn't do that with, you could easily just put that in an S3 um, storage bucket, this one basically, and, and then use that installer. So all of these instances spinning up now are building all of our images in parallel and it's all defined in one template. And so once, once they're all done, we have the means to be able to launch our infrastructure. So if this was the first time that we were doing things, we would go to init and uh, we always need to source environment variables before we do anything. And we use Terraform to actually initialize these resources. I'm also using TerraGrunt, which is a wrapper for Terraform. And I've only been using this recently, but it's solved a lot of problems. So um, if we do TerraGrunt apply, TerraGrunt really helps to keep everything um, modular. Oh, sorry, I meant TerraGrunt run all apply. We'll go through each of the modules in our init directory and deploy them all. So TerraGrunt helps solving initializing what's called remote state. So Terraform tracks uh, basically the resource states that it creates and it allows us to then not be attached to the data that's on this instance. So if this instance were to be destroyed, we could pick up that Terraform remote state um, on another instance and continue where we left off. So what we're doing here is we're creating a few profiles that would normally be needed for your Packer build. I've already created this, so you would normally do this before your Packer build actually, um, because you need a profile that gives these instances permission in order to access things like cloud storage, um, your S3 cloud storage, where you might have installers screwed away. And once everything's initialized, so we would have actually built our images after that. I'm sorry, I actually showed this process a little bit out of order. Okay, and with that done, it is possible after initialization and building of images that you would have new environment variables available. So we would grab those again, and then we're gonna go and do our final deployment. So when we jump into deploy, we're gonna do the same thing. Terragrant run all apply will spin up uh, two VPCs, essentially two different networks, one for Vault to live within, um, which may become a main account one day. But at the moment, I'm trying to keep this all within one account in order to make it easier for people to use. But I'm definitely designing it with that in mind to potentially create different accounts for different resources. And so what's happening here is Terraform and Terragrant are spinning up a whole bunch of things. They're um, creating profiles with policies, for instances. Then um, on initialization, if this was a first run, you'd also be using Vault to um, define certain access control to those profiles that are on the instances. So certain instances are gonna have certain permissions. For example, the VPN instance has permission to um, update a password but it doesn't have permission to read a password. So it's, it's allowed to go and update a password that we might use uh, remotely for, for access on site. Um, we might have, you know, all of the instances need SSH certificates. So they all have the ability to phone into Vault and uh, acquire an SSH certificate. And then um, 
you know, each of the instances might have some special abilities. For example, Deadline DB might request um, certain certificates required for its use. Uh, you will also have something like, what's another example? Uh, we might have an internal vault client. So the internal vault client might have certain abilities uh, where we intend to allow people to say make requests and we try to not really allow that to occur or we, we want to get to a state where we're not doing that from uh, a public network or any of the public instances. So we're creating our two different networks, our VPC uh, for Vault and our VPC for our rendering cluster. We're also creating um, a, we're creating two public instances. So we've got a VPN and a Bastion host. And the purpose of the Bastion host is to allow uh, remote access um, to request information from Vault because we don't want people using SSH to get into the VPN itself. The VPN really has that dedicated purpose of providing encrypted traffic uh, as a tunnel. And once that's all up, we're going to get to a state where uh, we can easily remotely configure a VPN. And what makes this VPN configuration a little bit different is it's configured as a gateway, which took me a, quite a while to figure out. It was, it's certainly, the VPN has consumed a lot of time, but what makes this VPN special is that it's configured as a gateway. So I only need to spin that up once on my network and provided my router is configured to route the traffic through. And that's actually really simple. It's like usually two lines really. Um, to route the traffic back to the other side, then all of the systems on my network are able to ping the systems on the cloud network. So it goes without saying, you wouldn't be doing this in an internet cafe. Um, you need to be using this on a trusted network. And it's certainly possible for us to configure a VPN so that it's not a gateway and it's really only um, contained to traffic from this system that we're running from. But that's not really um, my current goal. Um, my current goal is to be able to run a hybrid cloud configuration in order to um, be efficient with costs wherever possible. So right now we're spinning up the Vault cluster and the Vault cluster is, it's, it's really amazing that um, HashiCorp share this type of technology um, open source. It is highly enabled for open source software. I definitely don't really get the impression that there's some paywall wall that's annoying with, with this software. Although I haven't yet figured out how to get MFA working for free. Um, I'm sure it's possible because there are certain providers that can provide MFA, but I haven't been able to figure that out yet. Um, and so Vault is um, a highly available cluster. So it's distributed over three nodes and they're able to be self-healing. So if any one of those nodes goes down, we're able to um, essentially automatically replace it. But while it's being replaced, the traffic will be routed to another um, Vault server instance. So now that the Vault's up, we're trying to establish a connection with DNS. And this is another um, new technology uh, that I've just started using, which is console. And console solves a lot of problems, especially when it comes to things like high availability. Like you can't really get away with just using IP addresses if you want things like self-healing instances because um, the IP addresses will inevitably change. You can't really have special IP addresses assigned to certain hosts anymore. So you kind of have to forget about that and um, resolve DNS another way. So console is um, essentially a distributed DNS service that allows instances to do things like phone in and say, hey, this is my service, I'm deadline, I'm over here. But you can also have other callbacks um, attached to those types of events with console. So it is possible to run Terraform scripts um, and custom operations when, um, when new hosts arrive, which is pretty cool. Like an example of something that might happen is we might have some remote storage like FSX, and that might arrive to the vault cluster, it will get registered. And when it gets registered, we might need to trigger a bunch of mounts remotely because the IP address is different. So we could use something like 
console and Terraform to, to trigger those mounts of a new um, remote storage cluster. So right now we are, now that Vault's up and we've established a connection, um, we were able to log in. Um, we, and by the way, anything you're seeing here, it's all gonna be destroyed. So there's no sensitive information that I'm concerned about because I'm gonna destroy this S3 bucket when I'm done. But um, so right now we've got, we've got our vault up and that means that we're able to then spin up the rendering VPC. And so that's our network that will contain our render nodes and that will contain a deadline database instance. I haven't tested um, any rendering cluster yet. This is just, um, you know, early stages. I'm, I'm just getting to the point where I'm wrapping up uh, what would really be the foundation for, for the network going on from here. So when that's all done, we basically get this nice little command at the end here. And I've already configured this laptop to have a certificate. So it's able to SSH into those hosts and those hosts set, but will basically ask my host if I have a certificate and my host is going to do the same to see if they have host certificates. And if everyone's all cool, then they're just going to be able to log into each, they're, they're going to be able to log in to these two hosts. So the first host here is our bastion. It's a, public it's it's a public node it's really the only public node that allows ssh access and then from there we're able to go into a private node where we might make requests of vault and the purpose of this is to be able to say we can use the vault ui if we want to uh, we can also we can also um, automate the acquisition of passwords and certificates to automate our vpn so it usually takes about 30 seconds for those certificates to arrive. So let's see, we may or may not be ready yet. We are, we are ready, cool. So we're in a private host now and that is forwarding the Vault UI. So we can actually use that from here. Now it's, it's important from here you would create a you'd normally create a token. I was already logged in before, but we would create a token just for a reasonable period of time for us to log in remotely. We wouldn't want to use anything like our, say a long lived admin token or anything like that. Um, for example, I would probably wanna create a token with a short time to live and use that for my login. So I might say, please give me a token that's gonna last, say, I don't know, two hours. And so now I've got an admin token that's good for two hours. So this secret isn't sensitive really, it's, it's sensitive for a period of time, but if someone were to acquire a log or watch this video even, in two hours it's totally useless. So um, it would look like this, we would log in with that. And now we're able to see our, um, our keys and values stored in our encrypted vault database. Now we are next, we're going to use this. We've got everything established. We've got um, encrypted connection, SSH connection to our um, remote network. And I want to use an automated script to configure my VPN now. So if I go into where my vagrant scripts are, So we're gonna use the wake script. We have to, the first argument is the environment, which is dev. And the second and third arguments are the two hosts that are required for us to jump in and acquire our certificates. And then it says, it provides a, an example command that you're gonna to need to run in Cloud9 in order to give this operation, a token. The token's got a TTL of five minutes um, and it's allowed to make two requests. And after that, the token's useless. So whichever comes first. Uh, so we're gonna make a token and it's limited really only to being able to read the VPN configuration. 
via, po via a policy that is um, automatically configured. And then we're gonna, we need to provide the OpenVPN user password. So when we jump in to, we're in the dev environment under the network path, we're gonna copy our dynamic password. So that password was automatically generated by the VPN when it started. And we'll enter that. And so what's happening now is this script's automatically jumping into that private host. It's acquiring the certificates required to, um, to spin up the VPN. And it's also configuring the VPN um, setting up the VPN config with that password so that this vagrant virtual machine will automatically um, spin up as a configured VPN to our remote network. So that takes about, I don't know, I think it, it takes a couple of minutes. While that's happening, when it's established a connection, we're in, this is a private host over here. So we're gonna use that private host and see, can it ping my MacBook Pro? And we'll do the same over there. So um, 101019, can the MacBook Pro ping that? 10.1.0.19. So uh, we're also gonna see that the MacBook Pro can ping that private host. So it, it won't, these, these won't function until Vagrant's finished doing its job. So Vagrant is uh, essentially a virtual machine that's described with code. Um, and Vagrant, when it turns on, it's automatically configuring itself in order to set up this, uh, I think we're on Ubuntu 18. I can't remember if it's Ubuntu 16 or 18. Um, and it's going to basically set itself up as a gateway. So we have these pre-configured IP addresses here for the network. So when Vagrant turns on in the dev environment, it's got a MAC address, which we can automatically generate, and it's got an IP address. So Vagrant, this, this virtual machine has a static IP address, and that's important because it's used to configure um, the static routes. So the static routes allow our router to basically say, well, any traffic into that um, cloud-based network has to go via this guy. Still more to be done. Well, while, while that's happening, I'll just go and check what happened with those image builds. So yeah, we can see we had our base images. These are the image IDs. Um, they also get tagged with their role. They get tagged with the commit hash so that the code that made them can be tracked. Um, they also get tagged with the SSL certificate expiry. So currently they have an SSL certificate in there just for console. Um, if someone were to acquire that AMI, it wouldn't really be much of a big deal because it's really just going to allow you to authenticate to the DNS. It wouldn't really give you any more abilities beyond that. Um, certainly it will be good in the future for us to automate acquisition of um, the SSL certificates, but it depends on depends on your philosophy. I mean, I don't think that SSL certificates should really be going over the wire, um, but it would be great to figure out, say, an encrypted workflow where we, say, have the certificates being acquired um, dynamically. And then we've got our final image builds here. So our deadline database, a render node, the VPN, um, an Ubuntu 18 basic image, CentOS 7 basic image, um, and our Vault and console servers there. All right, so that's it, we're done. We have a connection. So 
Now, our private instances in AWS that are not publicly accessible are able to um, establish a connection with my MacBook Pro and my MacBook Pro can go the other way around. For example, if I wanted to ping my NAS, which is that, we can also see that the private host in AWS is able to ping my NAS, which serves out NFS. So it's possible for my instances in AWS to also mount my NFS shared storage, um, which is really great for things like ephemeral data. PDG, for example, generates lots of ephemeral data um, and it's required for um, farm processors to have access to that. So I would use, I would use that for PDG, for example. But anything heavy or big, I would be synchronizing to S3 Cloud Storage first, and then probably looking at another solution like uh, AWS FSx. So um, yeah, I'm I'm really excited to share this and where it's at with you guys. Right now, we have a foundation that would give someone the ability to build their own images and configure them with deadline to, to deploy. They could use their own um, deadline database or they could start to try and configure the one that we're currently working on. Um, presently, there's no, we haven't configured deadline, we haven't configured render nodes yet, but we provide the network that would allow people to um, handle cloud resources themselves and get a lot of the challenges out of the way with um, security and getting that VPN going. So um, thanks for watching. I'm looking forward to sharing more in the future with you guys.